Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins on the local news roundup. CMS is back in the news this time. Questions surface about their changing aspects of or changing aspects of bond funded projects without telling anybody. CMPD puts more resources toward de-escalation training for officers. The result of the no vote on the arts sales tax is beginning to be felt. Some organizations talk cutbacks, cutbacks, even survival. The Wells Fargo scandal continues to unfold and may have been worse than we thought. And President Trump will be at CPCC at lunchtime today. Our roundtable of reporters is ready to detail those and other stories. And seated around this table are Ann Doss Helms, reporter for WFAE News. Good morning. Good morning. David Borax is also with WFAE News. Welcome to Hello, you. Mike. Jonathan Lowe is rep- reporter anchor for Spectrum News. Good morning. Good, be- good to be back. And Mary C. Curtis is a columnist for Roll Call and contributor to WCCB TV. Hello there. Good morning, Welcome. Mike. Uh, we're going to uh, talk to Joe Bruno in a moment with Channel 9 because he is at the, where President Trump will be speaking. But I want to start with the weather because the weather became a, a, an increasing story throughout the day yesterday and is a story this morning because schools are closed because mm-hmm. of the weather. What, what, why are they closed? Uh, flooded roads all across, and, and it's not just, uh, you know, inner city or urban areas. It's across the county. So people have to keep in mind if the buses can't travel safely. Um, there's also a number, CMS said, a number of schools that don't have power today because of all of the trees and power lines that came down. So um, all all schools are closed today, as well as all practices have been canceled for today. And this well. is true in a number of surrounding counties as, as well. well. I, I They're mean, either closed or on a two-hour delay. All the way up to the mountains. Okay. It's good to hear this explanation because I'm one of those people that got up and I had a smooth commute today and I <laughs> so wondered why. why the heck did they cancel <laughs> school? Well, I took a very well, circuitous route because I'm in Myers Park and there was trees across Queens World West. And um, I also got yesterday an interesting Facebook post from my cousin here who said, I'm in Walmart with 300 of my new friends, and I think I've seen a tornado for the first time. Wow. Well, and because, you know, what was interesting was a, a, a lot of people in the uptown area, especially because of the tornado warnings yesterday, um, there were evacuations. Uh, my uncle works in one of the um, uh, Wells Fargo towers and texted me to make sure I was okay because I live in Uptown, but also said that they had moved everybody to interior parts of the building. So it, it affected yesterday a lot of people. I was told even at our building, our, our main our main campus at, yes. at WFAE, that people on the upper floors of that building came down. Because that building's pretty much all glass. Yeah. yeah, and the business side all came over to the newsroom side, which is kind of a bunker. And, yeah. you know, we have our little man-made lake, so our biggest damage was one of the fountains flipped over somehow. So, so we had flooding on East Boulevard. We had trees down on Queens Road, Kings Drive. Uh, I think there was a tree down at, at near on Park Road at some, at some point. Was... And I got phone alerts throughout the day yesterday. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty scary stuff because it yeah. just says tornado alert. That's you know, it. No, no, no more information. And not just alert. They were tornado right. warnings, warnings, which warnings. meant one had been spotted. So what we knew this was coming, but was this a lot worse than we thought it was going to be? I think it was uh, as bad as, as they warned us it would be. I just think we're not used to this. Right. I, my thought yesterday as we were reporting on this was that it was a lot more intense than when we covered the hurricanes. I mean, the hurricanes came through, there was high winds, there was heavy rain, but these storms were uh, really bursts of really high winds. They were moving at, in, in one case, like 60 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour. The tornadoes were touching down around our area. I don't think we've had a, a, anything this serious in a while. And that okay, meant that you could get out and think things were okay, and all yeah. of a sudden you're caught in something really bad, which Very is yes. why I think CMS did the right thing, not putting everybody on the road to dismiss schools I early. Think they had a, I don't think they had an option. No. It, um, it would have just it, put your you buses know, no in the worst power of it. And yeah. No power in schools. But I, I know that we're talking a lot about CMS in Charlotte, but um, specifically I know that Matthews was hit really hard. There were a lot of uh, neighborhoods that had trees on houses. And up in uh, Cabarrus County, hmm. uh, there was a, a, actually a subdivision where they believe a tornado touched down. And, wow. and people's bathtubs were out in front yards and – it was pretty significant. Really? Yes. Yeah. Oh. The video is the video is crazy. That uh, you know you don't know, Mike, because you don't have power or, or internet <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or TV. Yeah, but or they're phone. they're attributing a couple of deaths to this as well. So I, th- I think at least two people two, died. Yes. So Joe Bruno is with us uh, on tel- on the telephone from uh, Channel Nine Eyewitness News, WSSC TV. Uh, you you want to chime in on this weather situation before we talk about Donald Trump? 
Yeah, the storm, you know, every time that there's a tornado warning in the Charlotte viewing area, television news stations break into programming and they stay on until I've, the tornado warning. I've heard comes. that, yeah. And so we broke in shortly after 10 and we didn't get off until about 2 o'clock. That shows you just how widespread this storm was. And it wasn't like it was just impacting a certain area of our uh, coverage area. It was everywhere. I mean, there were tornado warnings up in Cherville all the way to Kannapolis. And, of course, we had a couple uh, different tornadoes that touched down. There was one uh, out in Belmont. There was the one in Kannapolis. And I believe officials at Matthews are pretty convinced that they had one touch down there. Too. Do we have any so idea how many people are A little bit of um, more examination by the NWS. Do we have any idea how many people might still be out of power? This uh, so the latest numbers, Cabarrus, uh, this was at like 6.30 this morning. So the, the lion's share of them are in Mecklenburg County. It's, uh, this was, at, again, 6.30 this morning. 16,742 outages in Mecklenburg County, 2,543 in Rowand, and then Gaston is eight, 844, Catawba, 420, and then Cabrera, 631. Okay. So, so Donald, you know, I think we're very lucky that this wasn't worse because, you know, we're the largest city without a radar nearby, which is <laughs> really hard to comprehend. But if it wasn't for meteorologists detecting one of those tornadoes on the yeah. airport radar, I mean, they wouldn't have been able to warn people about yeah. what was coming. That's so significant, that's too. And pe 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 and people that's should a very significant conversation. People should know that all of the chief meteorologists at all of the broadcast stations in this area, all of them, have banded together to encourage the National Weather Service to put a radar yes. back here in Charlotte, because our nearest been, radar is Greenville Spartanburg. Correct. And it can't see certain things because it's over the horizon. Correct. Uh, it, this is insanity. This has been going on for a while. Yes. I know that that, that uh, our chief meteorologist, uh, Jeff Crum, uh, Nines, Chief Meteorologist Steve Udelson, Steve Udelson uh, Brad Panovich over at CNC, they have all Eric, been advocating let's, let's for Let's bring this up forward. Eric. Eric Thomas. Uh, Eric Thomas. I'm sorry, Eric, <laughs> uh, if you're listening. But those guys have been pushing for this for a while, and I think it's these storms that prove right. how, how much needed that is. Okay, so let's move on because Joe Bruno is uh, talking to us from CPCC this morning, because, and he's been there since early this morning. Why did you have to go so early? The president's not going to speak until around lunchtime. <laughs> Yeah, well, the media check-in was between 7.30 and 8.45, and we can't leave once we're in. And so where are you? Where, where are you right, right now? now? Right now, I am in room 248 of the Overcash <laughs> building, uh, 255 for accuracy's sake. Uh, but the media is holed off in the two different rooms up in the Overcash building while we await the president's arrival. So there's this whole day of session planned around HBCUs, Opportunity Zones, Workforce Development, but for some reason the media is not allowed in any of them. The hmm. only part that we can record is the President's remarks when he arrives here around lunchtime. So he is bringing with him uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson, who was just here a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the whole idea is to talk about primarily about uh, Opportunity Zones. Is that the idea? Correct, and the Opportunity Zones are those uh, low-income census tracts that have been designated as areas that could use development and basically provide tax breaks to developers who invest in those areas. Uh, there's more than a dozen of these Opportunity Zones in Charlotte. Seventeen, to be exact. Mm -hmm. Seventeen, to be exact, yes. Uh, Eastland Mall is probably the most well-known Opportunity Zone, but a lot of uh, them exist over there in Five Points, the Johnson D. Smith and Roswell's Ferry area as well. So who will be in the audience when the president speaks today? Well, from what I could tell as I was uh, waiting uh, to get into uh, the building, I saw a couple local mayors. I saw uh, the NCOP chairman um, and, and other business leaders who are here to talk, of, who are here to learn more about the Opportunity Zones. Um, I did ask if the mayor will be here. I was told that she has another event on her schedule, which <laughs> actually happens to be Michael Bloomberg's campaign event. Um, Bloomberg will not be in town, but he is having two people that were featured in his television ad that aired during the Super Bowl. It's an anti-gun event. Um, and I was told the mayor may not attend that, but that's on her schedule right now. Uh, I believe Councilman Tark Bakari and Ed Driggs, of course, the city council's Republican members, will be at this event today. Okay. But um, it is interesting that the mayor, who serves on a White House advisory committee, is 
choosing to put the Bloomberg event on her schedule ahead of this. We talked a little bit about opportunity zones on this program yesterday when we were talking about the pros and cons of the tax cut, because this, this, this opportunity zone plan, which is happening all over the country, not just in Charlotte, was a way, was part of the tax plan, and it's a way to help, allegedly help impoverished areas or uh, blighted areas by encouraging investment in those areas. But now there is concern that this investment is really benefiting the rich more than it's benefiting the people who live around those zones, and it's leading to gentrification. Uh, and the mayor, surprisingly enough, has some su suspe suspicious thoughts about that, which we'll share when she joins us next week. Uh, is this fundamentally a Republican idea, or are any Democrats on board with this, Joe, or do you know? Well, you know, during the State of the Union, uh, the Democratic senator from Arizona stood up and applauded when President Trump uh, praised Senator Tim Scott for introducing the Opportunity Kirsten Zone Cinema. program. Mm -hmm. Kirsten, yes, Kirsten Cinema. So I think there is some bipartisan level of support for Opportunity Zones, uh, yeah. but the gentrification issue is definitely one that is out there. The White House kind of has tried to explain it as well. Gentrification was happening in these areas before um, the this Opportunity Zone program existed, Which is and now true. you know leaders can have some more control over you know making sure the development is purposeful by working with the developers going for these tax cuts. Mary, yeah, I was just going to say that um, the uh, dangers and the warnings about gentrification it really has resonance in Charlotte in particular. They have their own history of urban renewal or urban removal, as some people have called it, uh, the neighborhood of Brooklyn, which was a thriving black neighborhood. Uh, and so there are always going to be some skepticism when people come in with these grand plans that are going to revitalize neighborhoods to make sure the people in those neighborhoods are getting some benefit and will see some economic and housing benefit from them. Because, as I said, we we do have a history. Um, so you, you will see some skepticism. Also the fact that the President, as we said, he's focused in the State of the Union address on this, and it does seem as he's getting closer to election that he's making outreach, particularly to uh, African American communities, minority communities, uh, to see if he can also appeal to voters in those areas. And so every, everything is political as well as economic. And the president is bringing with him to this speech the once homeless veteran Tony Rankin, who was a guest at the State of the Union address on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, do you know Tony's story, Joe? Yes, he uh, served a tour in Afghanistan. Uh, he, when he finished his uh, tour. He unfortunately uh, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, fell into drug addiction. Uh, he was living in his car with his wife, and that's when he came across a construction project that was uh, being operated in Nashville, Tennessee, by a company by the name of R Investment. They offered him a job, and that has allowed him to get an apartment. Uh, he's off drugs completely. He's back with his wife. And he credits working with our investments on Opportunity Zones projects with helping get his life back in order. So I have 30 seconds left. The president's arriving around noon to speak today at CPCC. And we never know the route the president will take to and from the airport. But what kind of traffic problems is that likely to cause? If, I, if you're planning on being on Billy Graham 77 or 277 between 12 and 130, I think you can anticipate the traffic issue. And, of course, the CPCC Central Campus, which is where he's speaking, is closed to students yeah. today, not because of the power of the weather, but because the president is there, and I guess that's a security thing. Joe Bruno from WSOC-TV Channel 9 Eyewitness News. Thanks for joining us, Joe. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. When we come back, CMS in the news yet again. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the state of Center City. We'll talk about uh, affordable housing and more. Stay with us at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Duke Energy, reducing carbon emissions in the Carolinas by 36% since 2005 and committed to continuing to lower emissions and increase renewable energy. More at dukeenergy.com slash facts. And Signature Healthcare, whose Uptown office offers 24-7 access to concierge healthcare, including in-office services like acute care, travel medicine, and executive physicals. Signaturehealthcare.org. It's politics Monday on this program on Monday. Oh, what fun we are going to have <laughs> as we talk about the week that was this week. Has there ever been a week like this week where you have a disaster in the Iowa primary, you have 
a State of the Union address, you have an acquittal, and then you have the president's response. We're going to talk about all of that Monday on this program with two political scientists who will try to prop up. The impeachment of the president ends, as expected, but for one Republican senator, the cost of ignoring the evidence is too high. What he did was not perfect. A State of the Union that tears up the script, and Iowa finds out the hard way that there's not an app for that. I'm Taz Willick. It's the Friday News Roundup, next time on 1A. The Roundup of the Week's news continues with 1A from 10 to noon, right after the Charlotte Talks Local News Roundup here on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks and the Local News Roundup here on uh, Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with Ann Doss Helms and David Borax, both from WFAE News, Mary C. Curtis from WCCB TV and Roll Call, and Jonathan Lowe, reporter anchor for Spectrum News. Nary, a week goes by <laughs> with us some unusual and troubling news coming out of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools this week. It was revealed, and the CMS that CMS is scaling back on the size of new high schools that it promised to build during the 2017 bond campaign. But no one really seemed to be aware, and and they really hadn't told the public before those decisions were made, and I'm getting the impression they didn't tell anybody, including the school board. What are we to make of this? Well, uh, Elise Dashu, the chair of the school board, um, phoned me as I was walking into the studio saying, I want to clarify before you go on the air. But it's still a... Basically, it sounds like this has been being discussed in bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Some school board members have had discussions with staff. Um, Charlie Jeter, who is their governmental liaison and their policy person, says, oh, yeah, we talked about this in community meetings. The two schools in question are a new school in the southwest part of Charlotte, which would relieve crowding at Olympic, and a replacement building for West Charlotte High School, which now has about 1,400 students. The 125-classroom building that was promised for Basically, all three. There's also a South Ardry Kell Relief School. All three of them were pitched as the same amount of money, about $110 million, 125 classrooms, 2,500 students. So they're saying, oh, we've kind of been talking about this. We haven't voted on it. And Elise says to let people know that at the February 25th board meeting, there will be a public, detailed discussion of all the bond projects. She says they are seeing some cost overruns. She says they are having some questions about whether a really huge high school is what's best for kids. But she's still not offering a lot of details. And she said, um, we have handled this in a confusing manner thus far, and I will own that. Um, And they have, because... Is it illegal to make changes without the public's knowledge? Is it it ill-advised to make changes without the public's knowledge? Or to to go to the public and ask for a billion dollars? It was one billion dollars. Well, 922 million. (laughs) A little change there. For for these schools. And then things change. Right. and, And enrollment is down, and that was not anticipated. But should would it have been normal to handle this in some kind of a more public manner? Would it have been normal for the people who were sitting in the offices at the administration to tell the school board? Yeah, and this isn't something where one reporter or two or three reporters played gotcha and said, you know, you have 24 hours to answer and then we're going to call you out. Yeah. This has been bubbling since at least August, which granted was also when you had the dramatic and sudden change in superintendents, but <clears throat> that was when... They had apparently picked a site for the South High School, and this was at the Old Providence Elementary Grounds, and some neighbors said, whoa, 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 this is not a good location. This is, you know, and so they agreed to hold off on that. I started asking them for an update on bond projects. I'm sure other people did. And again, this thing with the smaller schools was bubbling out. It feels like this could have been kind of a ho-hum thing if they had had somebody who could say, oh, yeah, here's where things stand. Here's why we're doing this. You know. Did this start in the Clayton Wilcox era, or did it start after he left? I believe it probably started in the Clayton Wilcox era. Because, and that's Because Aunt Adrian Johnson, who serves on the bond committee, says that she was surprised to find out about these decisions. She said, quote, nothing has ever been mentioned. It almost slid under the radar. Was that the intent? I don't know. And that's, again, one of the things I asked Elise was, I can remember a time when they had somebody in charge of construction, and I could pick up the phone and call him and say, hey, what's the deal with this? And he would answer. Mm -hmm. And even if they made a mistake, which sometimes they did, he'd say, oh, we made a mistake. We're going to fix this. And I specifically said that to Elise, and I said, do you have a person like that who knows what's going on and you have simply failed to communicate it, or do you not have such a person? 
And there was this long sigh, and she said, I don't know how to answer that. I'm going to hold off on that. She, and then she said, well, they're bringing in a consultant, Dennis Lacaria, who the insiders will remember him from those days. He was actually he was with the guy CMS. you could call, actually. He was one of the guys you could call. He then went to work for the county. They're bringing him on as a consultant, saying they need to, I, wouldn't say, I would say get out in front of it, but they're behind it. So they need to get <laughs> to a point where they are communicating well with the public, yeah. and they know that. A handle on do, it. do we know who yeah. authorized the changes? Who was in on making these changes? Have the changes been finalized, or is this still open to discussion? They have, have these, not been finalized. Has construction begun on these schools already? No, yes, well, that maybe? That is a good question. I am okay. not sure, but they're pretty far down the road with design, I would think, on West Charlotte and with the Southwest. And one of the other questions that was raised was the delay on the South you know, the Ballantyne area, Ardry Kell, yeah. I think that's no surprise at all because, okay. again, they thought they had land and they thought they were moving on it, and that apparently is still up in the air. If they have to find land in Ballantyne, that's, A, it's a delay, but, B, it's also a cost addition. What has uh, the new superintendent, Ernest uh, Winston, had to say about this? Nothing. Um, and I, again, had been chasing down other staff who are likely to know more details and had not had any success getting what I thought should be some pretty simple answers. The Observer <laughs> specifically reported that they asked for Ernest Winston and were declined that. So, um, Is this just another in a series of unfortunate incidents in CMS? Is this a matter of bad communication, bad management, bad luck, or is something more serious at play here? I mean, this is ridiculous what's going on over there. Well, and I think that's that's a question that's up in the air. You have a new management team. You have a new superintendent who replaced one that left under questionable. It all that, doesn't it? Well, and that's another question is are they dealing with fallout from previous bad decisions? But you essentially have now a new school board chair, a new superintendent. They've kind of had this honeymoon of not being the old people, and they seem to be trying very hard not to mess up. Yeah. But the question is can they make decisions and lead? And I think that's what we're going to see in the coming weeks. They, they, they have not done particularly well. Uh, you know, I think by trying to not step out and make mistakes, they've essentially made a mistake because okay. we're having this discussion. So now. meanwhile, the school board in, in November decided to hire an independent compliance officer to monitor the superintendent and other top staff. I wonder why. They talked about it again on Tuesday night for about three hours, and they don't seem to be any closer to bringing in that person, what's the holdup? Uh, again, they are just, they, are, they have formed a subcommittee, the four school board members who will develop a profile, who will then launch a search, and they'll bring finalists back to the board. Um, so there's not even a firm timeline for having that person, let alone getting <clears throat> them integrated into this whole system. But right now, there are two people who report directly to the school board, and that is the superintendent and the general counsel. Mm -hmm. This would be a third person, so this person would have <clears> some independence. And almost all school districts have a federal compliance officer. They may actually be required to have one, but this is a much broader position, and they're saying it's quite rare for school and boards asked, to do this. you asked school board chair Elise Dashu if the uh, creation of this position was related to the exits of Heath Morrison and Clayton Wilcox. Um. I, there are definitely some lessons learned from um, expensive challenges that have come up because of lack of compliance and no simple way for the board to learn um, when compliance issues arise. Why? Why have there been no way, there's been no way for the board to know when compliance issues arise? They're the board. Uh, that's a good question. And, <laughs> okay. you know, but if your top staff person is potentially not giving you the full yeah. picture, that gets sticky. It sounds like they're aware of the need to change the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> and you hope they'll change the reality and not okay. just the narrative. CMPD broke ground this week on a new uh, de-escalation training facility in Southwest Charlotte. The city and the FBI are in on this. They're putting money toward, I think it's a 2.4 million dollar facility and yep. CMPD Chief Kerputney says it will bring de-escalation training into the 21st century. This gives us an opportunity when things are less stressful to hone our skills so that we can better react. So we've been talking about this for a while now uh, since a series of police altercations with individuals, citizens. Uh, why do we need a 2.4 million dollar facility to teach de-escalation? Why can't they do it the way they're doing it? have been doing it. Because um, they actually had all of the, the media come down to where this, um, 
the, the groundbreaking ceremony was earlier this week, but they brought everybody down to where this facility is going to be built uh, and actually showed us and walked us through their current, what they call active shooter house. It was built in the 90s. Um, I had a chance to walk through it myself. Uh, and it is, it, it, first of all, it's open to the elements. So if it rains, if it's cold, um, that can affect the training. Um, but also, since it was built in the 90s, it's 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 not the greatest, okay. I, I, for lack of a better word. It's, it's kind so of long ago. Rickety. Uh, so the this new $2.4 million facility, it's going to be a two-story building. It's going to have a, cla a 50-seater classroom. Um, so it will be a controlled environment. It will have audio-visual capabilities so that the they can create scenarios, active shooter situations. Uh, they'll bring in FBI agents. You'll have a lot of officers across the region training at this facility. So it will give them uh, the, the closest uh, example or scenario would be what happened at UNC Charlotte and how um, it, you know, CMPD was there and able to actively or quickly, I should say, respond and help UNC Charlotte police, um, which um, they say helped de-escalate that situa situation quicker. Yeah. So, so the groundbreaking for this facility comes as uh, CMPD, as you mentioned, has been trying to change its de-escalation practices. And back in November, they came out with a new policy. It included a definition of de-escalation for the first time. Uh, and Chief Putney talked about uh, three issues, getting time, distance, and cover uh, so that they can slow things down in an incident like yeah. that. They yeah. also changed the words use of force in the policy to response to resistance. So all of this is part of a campaign by CMPD to show that they are responding to community concerns about these shootings, which have resulted in the deaths of mostly African-American men. At the end of last year, I'm going to move on because we have a lot, a lot of territory to cover. At the end of last year in December, uh, North Carolina became the final state in the nation to raise the age, meaning 16 and 17 year olds now charged as, will now be charged as juveniles. And and now the Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Department is making changes to accommodate the law. What are they doing? Well, I, I, I think what what's new over at the Sheriff's Office is they actually have a facility for um, juveniles. Yeah, they're moving are, adults out. Correct. And they're putting games in. They're putting in ping pong, ping pong tables and um, foosballs and TVs and Nintendos and... And also giving them some job training skills, right. classes, um, uh, working with you know therapists, counselors, court liaisons uh, to help steer them in the right. And direction. they don't call them inmates anymore; they call them residents or clients. Correct. And, 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 and when they come in, correct, they are all given a tablet, like a an iPad style tablet. Why? This is all part of trying to change the uh, the way that we look at this. This is at the old jail north, and uh, it's all going to be 16 and 17 year olds now. And the idea is that you know these these kids used to be housed with older inmates or older uh, clients, if you want to call them that. Uh, and they there was the impression that they could that these seasoned criminals would rub off on these kids. And they want to try and save them from that and give them an opportunity to get out of that cycle of violence that they're in. And so uh, giving them a tablet, providing education and training, that sort of thing is all designed to shift them from the path that they were on to a new path. And every, every said the tablets were for online learning. They're not, they're blocked from social media. So this is not just, hey, have, have something to play games on. And other cities have done this, and it's shown that it's worked, and that you know that this is really the way to go when it comes to that. And um, other cities who have had, you know, you've had the Rikers Island, Khalid Browder case, you know, the young man who committed suicide. And when you put these young kids in with the older inmates, it's not just that they, it would rub off, but psychologically, it's so tough for them because yeah. they're they're young people. And but at the same time, they are acknowledging that some of these teens have committed violent yes. crimes, including yes. one <laughs> homicide. So they're saying this is a balance we have to find. It's not just being soft on them, it is trying really, really hard to rehabilitate everybody but acknowledge the yeah. real challenge. These are young people, they're going to live a long time and they might be back in the community. So it's also, you know, <laughs> trying to change that as well. So Charlotte Center City Partners released their Charlotte Center City Report for 2019. They do this every year. What did it show? 
David. Well, that's right. And this is a report on activity that includes development and population growth and that sort of thing. And this one looked back uh, at what's been happening since 2010 in the center city. And no surprise, the population is up 186 yep. uh, percent in the last decade. We've got 12,000 new housing units, which back a decade ago, there really wasn't much housing uptown. So uh, it's become a more residential area. There's also 8 million square feet of new office space, which means about 41,000 new workers uptown. Anybody who has been uptown and watching this, you, you see it every day. This is a different place than it was 10 years ago. Um, this report also celebrated some of the big economic development wins of the past year. Companies like um, Avid Exchange expanding, uh, Lending Tree opening its headquarters, bringing its headquarters uptown. Lowe's is doing a tech center in the South End. Uh, Truist Bank, the newly merged SunTrust and bb and is putting their headquarters here. So lots of new offices and Honeywell. You know, Honeywell is moving from the northeast down to Charlotte. So all of this is really, uh, it shows a pretty lively center city. Mm -hmm. They also <clears> talked uh, the other night about um, the next big growth area is going to be the south end expanding down that way. And some of these projects that we mentioned are there already. And the Gateway District. Yeah, yeah. The, Gateway the, district the south district end is coming. really booming. Well, That's amazing, yeah. with the light, along the light rail. Yeah, and so is the traffic. The, yeah. <laughs> the Gateway District, I never even heard of until David Tepper came along, <laughs> except for the Gateway Center down there on uh, uh, Trade Street. Uh, one of the other things that Michael uh, Smith, the CEO and president of Charlotte Center City Partners, had to talk about was that there have been 1.9 million scooter trips. <laughs> I like that one, too. Uh, uh, since their arrival in 2018, uh, 250,000 out-of-town visitors came here last year for conventions, and there are like 2,500 or 3,000 more hotel rooms, or maybe it's more than that, than there were for the Democratic convention that this summer for the Republican convention. So we're growing by leaps and bounds. One other aspect of this that we should mention around this talk about all this great growth is this kind of elephant in the room, which is that affordable housing remains something yep. that's in very short supply in Uptown. I mean, is there any? I don't even know I if there is there any. Is. You know? no. They said and the average rent was almost $1,800 well, I mean, a month. I mean, it, that's not affordable. Yeah. Now, we do have uh, some of the senior affordable housing. That's right high rises in uptown but outside of that I and, and the city of charlotte has been working on that this has been a pet project of the mayor and i think the entire city council is on board with this but the county commission is now getting involved in this evidently uh, they're moving ahead with plans to develop a 14 acre site uh, in greer, greer heights uh, this the county isn't building this they're they're bringing in other people to do it but county commissioner Vil malik says the city ought to feel bad that someone else has to step in and do its job. I have a real problem with the city not doing its job. What does that mean? You know, she's being critical of the fact that we have this shortage. And, you know, the last numbers that the county put together said across Mecklenburg County, there is a shortage of 51,000 units for people who make less than 80% of the area median income. Um, that's families with an income around 63,000. And so we definitely have this. I mean, I don't think we can say the city is doing nothing. Right. Clearly, over the past couple of years, they've increased the uh, housing bond that they do. The $50 million um, housing bond, which is actually going to be coming up for a re-up in the next mm -hmm. election. So, the, uh, you know, the city has done here recently but the county has to do the county has to. never done affordable housing before they are doing it now so when we come back uh, proof positive that the city of charlotte has not gone to the dogs and arts in crisis among other stories which we'll be hitting up on in the next 20 minutes as we continue on the local news roundup at charlotte talks on wfae Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Live Nation presenting Chris Stapleton's All-American Roadshow with guests L. King and Kendall Marvel Friday, August 7th at PNC Music Pavilion, Charlotte. Tickets available Friday at 10 a.m. at LiveNation.com. The roundup continues next in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock on 1A with a look at the national news roundup. The Senate voted to acquit President Donald Trump in his impeachment trial. The president also gave his third State of the Union address and Macy's department store announces it is closing 125 stores and laying off about 2,000 employees. Those stories and more coming up next on 1A and we will continue our look at local and regional news when we come back in about 30 seconds. Stay with us.
I'm Mike Collins. It's on to New Hampshire in the chase for the Democratic presidential nomination, while South Carolina's primary also looms large. We still have a fight on our hands. We're in this for the long haul. Will the first in the South primary be as pivotal as it's been in years past? Join Charlotte Talks for a conversation with experts on Palmetto State politics. We'll be at Winthrop University's DeGiorgio Campus Center on Wednesday, February 12th at 7 p.m. Register now to attend at WFAE.org. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Mary C. Curtis is here from uh, Roll Call and WCCB-TV. Jonathan Lowe, Spectrum anchor reporter, is also here. Andos Helms and uh, uh, um, uh, David Borax. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> from uh, WFAE News are also with us here for the local news roundup. City Council took up the issue of something I've never heard of before, bullhooks. Uh, evidently, these are... are devices that you use to prod circus animals along with in the streets, right? And, and they decided to ban bull, the use of bullhooks, as other cities have. Yeah, but but why mean, now? Um, but because the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus is out of business because of this. Well, there is also, though, the Universal Circus, which okay. has historically come, has been coming for years. When I was a kid here, I went to the United It's been coming here that long. So, you know, this, this, this uh, effort to ban circuses in, city, in, in the city, it, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because, you know, while there are concerns about inhum how these animals are treated, there, uh, I think, you know, the, uh, Universal Circus is a uh, people will tell you a good example of how it, it's uh, important entertainment and it teaches kids about animals and that they do treat the animals humanely. So there, there's two sides to this. But um, city council the other day, they asked staff to draft an ordinance to ban inhumane instruments from being used on wild animals and circuses coming to the city. city. But they're going to have a, a public hearing on it February 24th. Okay. So, the other issue about animals they took up has a lot of animal rights activists pretty, darn, pretty doggone upset. Uh, they refused, the council refused, to ban the tethering of dogs. For people who don't know anything about that, what is that? So tethering of dogs is basically when you are going through neighborhoods and, and you see them chained to a tree right. out in a front yard. Um, there are a lot of people who who think that is also inhumane. Uh, and so the city said there's already a tethering ordinance, ordinance in place, and it was from 2011. Um, and it says a couple of things, Mike. It says... Uh, it regulated based on sp specific criteria that were added to the ordinance effective in 2011. A uh, couple things. It says you have to allow the dog access to adequate food, water, and shelter, be a minimum of 10 feet in length, include a swivel on both ends so that it doesn't get wrapped up and, and, and knotted up or wrapped around the dog, mm -hmm. be made of either metal chain or coated steel cable, allow the dog a reasonable and unobstructed range of motion without the possibility of entanglement, strangulation, or other injury, and lastly, only be used for dogs over four months of age. So, so tethering so, has already been banned in places yeah. like Atlanta, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, and other cities our size. Why is, are they reluctant to do it here? Because I think... It will impact. It, some will say it could adversely impact people in certain neighborhoods who can't afford to. You know, they want to have a dog, but maybe they don't can't afford to have a dog house or a fence or or take them to a doggy daycare. That's right. kind of the thing. If you have to go to work and you have a dog that you're going to leave at home, mm -hmm. the alternatives can be expensive. Right. So I think the city is trying to keep that in mind. And while there, you know, are a lot of people in the community. But well, wouldn't that be true in Atlanta, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, and other cities? Yeah, it's a value judgment. It's, okay, it's right. whether you want to impose another thing that can bring, I don't know if it would be fines or even misdemeanor th charges, but something more that is a burden on the poor and, for basically trying to and live. Mike, finally, I, you know, I've lived in, you, compare, it may be a little bit of apples to oranges. It, city to city can be, it, it's how open they are and dog friendly they are. I, I, I lived in Phoenix, and in Phoenix, you can take your dog anywhere. You can take <laughs> them in any store, 
anywhere that you want to take them. You can't do that here. So I think it's 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 city to city it, based on how dog friendly it is. That's because it's too hot in Phoenix to be outside. <laughs> exactly. Okay, in November, a voter said no to a quarter cent sales tax hike to be devoted mostly to the arts. 50% was going to go to the arts and the rest was going to go to parks and recreation and education. Voters said no. The Arts and Science Council explained uh, all during this campaign that their formerly highly successful fundraising campaign no longer worked. The, 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 the does, don't, it doesn't work anymore for whatever reason. And that's true. And so they needed that influx of cash. And they said if they didn't get it, the organizations and the individuals that they support would suffer. And apparently that's beginning. This week, Opera Carolina laid off their executive director and Actors Theater of Charlotte sent out an email uh, saying they sent out an email to 15,000 patrons and single ticket buyers and others who have ever set foot in their theater pleading for help. They said, quote, Actors Theater of Charlotte may not be able to continue without immediate financial assistance. That's pretty dire. How much of that is because of cutbacks at ASC? And how much of that is simply because they don't have the money to continue? So uh, this is an organization that is, it stands out among Charlotte theater companies because it's a paid professional actors in every production. Most of the other theater companies that we have locally are, uh, you know, I've acted in several shows where I got a $250 check. I've acted in others where there was no money at all. But this one stands out. And that has been uh, a pride for them, but it's also been a source of uh, heavier expenses. And so in recent years, their revenues have been declining and they've continued to pay their actors. And, uh, and they also know, had a problem because they had a permanent home on yes, Stonewall. They uh, had yeah. a permanent home. Yeah. They had to move to Queens University. It was yeah. Mike and I have been on the board and uh, yes, and they had that beautiful little theater. It's and gorgeous. The, yes. And so, now that they're in Hadley uh, over at Queens, it's, and I've been to those shows too. But they had to travel for a couple of years. And so they, they did. Found. And, even, and the last, even it's difficult to get to that little theater. So it's, they've had so many problems. But the last couple of years, they've been dipping into their reserves right. is the key point here. And uh, they ran a deficit the last few years. And they're saying that their reserves are not enough to cover another season right and now. And one challenge may be that they went to these same supporters when they thought they had a new building lined up exactly. and essentially did a capital campaign and people wrote checks and then the building that fell, fell through. through. And I think they just rolled that money into operating yeah. because they were, again, trying very hard to stay afloat. And the new theater, you probably all know, it's considered part of Queens, but it's actually inside of Myers Park Traditional Elementary School. So you walk in, it's a, a school that does the Stephen Covey's Habits of Highly Effective People. So you're walking past, you know, elementary school restrooms and you you, know, you can't have drinks inside. So it, it definitely has a little less of a chic yeah. theater going feel than the old setting. Uh, the, 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 the problem here is that theater, Charlotte is not friendly to theater. Period. I'm gonna. It, it's just not. It, 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 tr theater is a troublemaking institution because, <laughs> because you can say things, uh, and and we have all these wonderful facilities. Thank God for for things like the touring Broadway shows. But we lost a resident equity theater company many years ago, Charlotte Repertory Theater, which did fabulous work. Actors Theater never wanted to be Charlotte Rep, but they've done their own thing for years and filled a niche very well. I mean, they filled it very well. And to their credit, they have not gone into the red. And that's what they're trying to say. We're not going to go into the red. We'll fold. We're not going to stiff people who have given us money or we, we've gotten product from that we need to do our shows and then not pay them. We're just going to fold so that they sent this out. But that's not necessarily attached to the uh, arts funding. But the Opera Carolina one is. They said a harsh economic climate for the arts as, and as possible reduction for fiscal 2021 from the Arts and Science Council, they had to lay that person yeah. off. And that is, she had just been hired is pretty the, much. Yes, right. like, yes. Is this just the tip of the iceberg or is, I mean, it, is the, this the first couple of shoes? The to ASC fall is cutting grants 50% this year. I think that's going to hit a lot of organizations. Well, and and it, well, and I was just going to say, Mike, uh, before we go to break, that we will learn more because the Arts and Science Council is doing a presentation to the county commissioners coming up on February 11th. So we'll learn more about what they are looking for in funding still after that yes. referendum failed right. in November. So very quickly, and you recently aired a series of reports on the school pairings that CMS entered, to in, entered into in 2017. There are families who work very hard to create diversity in those paired schools. Elizabeth Morrison is a PTA president of the paired Billingsville Cotswold Elementary School. Studies and research overwhelmingly support that all children benefit from diverse environments, not just the low performing students. 
not just the minority students, not just the low income students, but everybody. When our children are in a diverse environment, we all rise. So this was an experiment to undo segregation. How's it working out? Well, it's complicated, as so many things are. I think at Billingsville and Cotswold, you have a genuinely diverse setting. You have people who are enthusiastic about it. Um, but you also have about 20 percent. They did not change the district, so it's the same territory. It has a magnet program. Um, and enrollment is down about 20 percent. So people are leaving. Um, so it's not working for everybody. Uh, and also, you know, every time you look at test scores, they just they feel like a punch in the gut right. because you want to think that everybody working side by side means everybody's getting essentially the same education and outcomes, but there's still huge disparities in proficiency rates. They measure growth. Um, the bottom line is there's no miracle solution. And that if you are a skeptic and if CMS tries to do this again, there are going to pe be people who say, if this really worked, we would see quick, dramatic gains. And on the test scores, which are not everything, mm. you're not seeing that. Okay. They're trying to remedy something that's taken way too many generations right. to build. CMS Superintendent Ernest Winston reported a couple of weeks ago that the multi-million dollar security system that are, has been installed in schools around the area doesn't work. And you, Jonathan, have an update on where all that stands. Yeah, so our, uh, giving credit to one of our reporters, Ruben Jones, who initially went to that news conference where the superintendent announced that, reached out again uh, a day ago to see what's going on <laughs> because Syntingix was given 30 days from January 10th to get it working. So that, that's, that's up Monday. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so CMS said simply – uh, it will, quote, evaluate the work of the vendor at that time to determine next steps, end quote. So we will see it, it, back in January, the uh, superintendent said if it's not met, they will sever the relationship. So we'll see coming up. Yeah, and I had asked about that and got pretty much the same answer that, you know, it's you're, they're still doing testing. They don't want to go out and say it's working again and still have problems. Yep. But I'm sure they don't want to launch the whole Pull back on it either. As everybody knows, the United States Senate this week finally reached a verdict in the impeachment of Donald J. Trump. Mr. Burr. Mr. Burr, not guilty. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tillis, not guilty. In fact, all the Republicans, except for Mitt Romney, voted to acquit the president on the first article, abuse of power. Romney joined his GOP colleagues on the second article, obstruction of Congress. All Democrats and the two independents uh, voted uh, guilty on the president's uh, situation. Have we heard anything else from North Carolina's Richard Burr or Tom Tillis or South Carolina's Lindsey Graham or Tim Scott that we haven't already heard a thousand times before? Well, we do have a couple of them that will be coming up for their elections. Uh, and Lindsey Graham will be up uh, for in South Carolina. And Tom Tillis, as we know, is going to be a part of, I think, a very contentious race here in North Carolina. And he has chosen, uh, in the beginning, he tried to be a little bit independent of this president. But increasingly, he has tethered himself to be quite a strong Donald Trump supporter. And he feels that that will probably get the base out, the Republican base, and even in a state as uh, divided as North Carolina, that he's going to need them uh, to to be reelected. Uh, so we witnessed a complete divide in the Congress and probably in the country where Democrats and the Republicans see the world completely different. It's like looking through a mirror. It's bizarro world. Uh, and yesterday, during his hour-long stream of conscious speech in the East Room of the White House, President Trump praised his supporters and essentially threatened his enemies. Nothing like that has ever happened before in the White House. It appears that he is declaring all-out war on his enemies and Democrats going into this election. And, of course, many people did take issue with Nancy Pelosi uh, tearing up his speech after he gave it on the uh, dais at, uh, in the House. Is this country irrevocably broken? Can we recover from this? I mean, this is like... I think that's open. I think that was a preview of what we're going to see for the re-election race. It's going to be go there, uh, very personal. Um, we've seen already a lot of retribution. Uh, Alexander Vindman uh, from the State Department, uh, it seems like, uh, who testified to the impeachment uh, committees. His, he's going to be pulled out of the White House, I've, I'm hearing. Uh, it's being reported. So he is naming names, and Democrats right now are acting like Democrats, if you look at the Iowa caucus, and um, very undecided on what's going to well, happen. Let's talk about the Iowa caucuses very quickly, because I have no time. But, but, but uh, 
I've not heard anybody talk about this. They screwed it up badly in Iowa, and part of the reason was because they had these phone apps that the precinct captions used, and evidently they had not done a dry run or they weren't properly trained on the app, and it didn't work. That's been talked a lot about. Mm -hmm. No one has ever talked about why in God's name you would let them use a phone app. We talk about how important it is not to have any computers that touch the Internet be used in voting. And here they have a phone app (laughs) on an Android phone. Are they insane? I know. And uh, I think you might be seeing a little bit the end of the Iowa caucus is first in the nation. This is the third cycle. Remember the uh, Santorum-Romney mix-up in 2012 and the Sanders-Clinton mix-up? And they've already been criticized as having such a non-diverse state be the first uh, one that determines it. So we're going to have a lot of problems there. But it was not being used for voting, Mike. It was being used for reporting the vote. Exactly right. Yes. It's still hackable. Which, which is worse, re- reporting incorrect results or, or p- pulling a lever and getting the wrong result from your personal vote? <laughs> I would argue the other, the latter, the former, rather. My well, gosh. you're looking as it's coming to South Carolina now. I know you're having a show on that. So. That's right. Uh, <laughs> a North Carolina state graduate landed yesterday at, in Kazakhstan. And it wouldn't be worth talking about, except that it's Christina Koch who landed there after having spent 328 days living and working at the International Space Station. Christina Cook, your record holder. She is out, thumbs up, and a huge smile. Yes, we are seeing it real time. She definitely looks glad to be home. That sound from NASA as they mounted her her return. She's one of the astronauts to uh, take part in the first all-female spacewalk and to set the record for the longest amount of time a woman has spent in wow. space. So she's back on Earth. When she gets a look at the on Earth, she might yeah. want to go back up. <laughs> one quick piece. Christina Cook. Chris Cook. Okay, but it's spelled K-O-C-H. Yes, Cook. J- Jonathan Lowe, Mary C. Curtis, Ann Doss Helms, David Borax. Thank you all for the hour.